Um, and to uh, start with our keynote speaker. And uh, we're very honored today to have uh, Lord Des Brown, uh, who was elected uh, chairman, vice chairman of the Nuclear Threat Initiative in March 2014. Uh, he is here to uh, offer his thoughts and reflections on the broader state of nuclear, the nuclear weapons threat, uh, the nuclear weapons threat reduction enterprise, uh, and how perhaps we can move forward in these difficult times, which to cite Larry Weiler again, uh, he reminded me that uh, these are tough times, especially with Russia, but uh, there have been worse times. Um, and uh, there, there are likely going to be better times uh, ahead, uh, more propitious um, uh, conditions. So uh, I've asked uh, Des uh, to uh, share his ideas about uh, what some of the actions uh, are that can be uh, undertaken to hasten progress uh, at this time, uh, given the political divisions here in Washington, tensions with Russia, conflicts and arms buildups elsewhere in the world, uh, to make the pursuit of the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons, um, uh, which, which make the, the, the pursuit of a world without nuclear weapons as challenging as ever. And uh, when we were discussing this ahead of uh, this week, um, I told him this is a challenging task, uh, but uh, Des is not a man who has uh, shied in the face of challenges. He's been uh, amongst the most active and outspoken and influential European leaders in the nonproliferation disarmament field uh, in recent years. Um, he's uh, in, in 2006, um, as you all might note from the, the bio, he was appointed to be the UK's Secretary of State for Defense, and from 2007 to 2008, he combined that role with the role of Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, and since 2009, he has been the convener of the top level group of parliamentarians for nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation, and the chair of the executive board of the European Leadership Network, has been, which has been particularly helpful and effective in recent years in bringing together a wide range of European leaders in support of uh, the, the nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation uh, issue. Um, he's also a member of the Group of Eminent Persons, uh, which was established uh, about a year ago by the Executive Secretary of the Conference of Tespan Treaty Organization, Lucina Zerbo, to help advance uh, global entry into force of the CTBT. And we had the chance to, uh, to speak with one another about uh, that difficult uh, challenge at the, the GEM Group's first meeting in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, so, very glad to have uh, Des with us to offer his thoughts, um, and after he speaks, we're going to get into a discussion, and I think he's looking forward to your questions and, and comments, um, especially uh, given the, the great uh, expertise and knowledge that we have in the room. So please join me in welcoming Des Brown. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, Daryl, for the kind and uh, challenging introduction. I mean, it is a pleasure to be here today with you in particular, a man uh, known across our community as an innovative thinker, not to mention a prolific writer and commentator. You and your colleagues at the Arms Control Association do so much to keep the focus on the issues so important to everyone here to hold our leaders accountable, to inspire creative thinking and to press for change. So we are grateful for your leadership and for the unyielding dedication to global nuclear security. Uh, I uh, discovered recently that in another unrelated aspect of my life, I have come to know well a London-based businessman who it turns out, and this is entirely coincidental, is the grandson of who I would call Gerard C. Smith, but you would I think probably say as Gerard C. Smith, the former chair of the board of the Arms Control Association, it caused me to do a bit of research. And Gerard Smith's contribution to disarmament and non-proliferation will be well known to many in this room, particularly if there are people here who have been in this business for 60 years. He was the chief US delegate to the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks in 1969 and the first US Chairman of the Trilateral Commission, among many other achievements. Uh, he had an extremely distinguished career in public service. And after 1980, when he resigned from the government for the last time, he retained his interest in 
and was extremely active in disarmament, strongly opposing President Reagan's Star Wars programme. And with George Kennan, McGeorge Bundy and Robert McNamara, I discovered, co-authored an article in Foreign Affairs calling on the US to declare a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons. I mean, this is a snapshot of this man's achievements, but uh, his tenacity in maintaining the integrity of his arguments, even in unreceptive times, ought, I think, to be an example to all of us. In the challenging times that presently we are living through, we must maintain our optimism and we must redouble our efforts. And as Larry Weiler reminded us, and I agree with this, we have been in tougher times. And in fact, some of us are young enough not to have lived through those tougher times, but, but they have existed. It's also a pleasure to speak with such an engaged and, dare I say, optimistic audience. We know that the topics you are tackling at today's annual meeting from the Iranian nuclear puzzle to the future of the non-proliferation and disarmament regime have long presented a significant challenge, and that challenge feels particularly acute today. But we also know that none of us would be in this room if we weren't determined to make progress on these vexing issues, and if we weren't optimistic that progress is indeed possible. But optimism doesn't mean that we are naive about the challenges ahead. The truth is that we are at a very precarious moment on a host of nuclear security fronts. Prospects for the P5 process and next year's non-proliferation treaty review conference are not encouraging. The incremental approach to disarmament, to the bargain that the recognised nuclear weapon states, the US, the UK, Russia, China and France struck over 45 years ago and now is so painfully slow that it too often feels as if we're moving backwards. And it's difficult to see a path forward when the five nuclear weapon states can't agree on how to proceed. And the non-nuclear weapon states are angry about the pace of progress towards disarmament. This situation, in fact, is so bad that the upcoming 2015 NPT review conference is neither a convincing agenda nor a leader at this point. In Geneva in 2008, when I spoke at the conference on disarmament as, I think, then the first ever defence minister to do so, and probably the only defence minister ever to do so, <laughs> Explaining how British policy on disarmament was then evolving, I said, and here I'm quoting myself, I apologise for this, but <laughs> I said it's, but it's, 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 it's intended to make a point rather than to convince you of the words. As part of our global efforts, we, are all, we, we also hope to engage with other P5 states and other confidence and other confidence building on nuclear disarmament throughout this NPT review cycle. This is the important sentence. The aim here is to promote greater trust and confidence as a catalyst to further reductions in nuclear warheads. Our intention, bringing the P5 together, was to create a force for progressive dynamism. It appears that inadvertently we created a cartel. Meanwhile, we have states expanding their nuclear arsenals, surreptitiously seeking nuclear weapons under the guise of a civil energy programme, and detonating nuclear test devices in the face of international condemnation, finding a productive course to take with respect to Iran and North Korea is a particularly difficult challenge. We saw approval of the uh, New START Treaty during President Obama's first term. An important achievement that I am quite sure could not have been realised without the very hard work of many here, Prospects for talk on additional reductions are dim at the very best. The chilling effect of recent events in Ukraine is that our agenda today is in danger of being put into deep freeze. Worse yet, the situation not only strains relations between Russia and the United States, it may serve, and is proving to do so for some, to boost the arguments of those who oppose reducing the role of nuclear weapons in NATO's security construct. Decades after more than 2,000 nuclear tests were conducted worldwide, leaving a ghastly humanitarian and environmental legacy amid growing concerns about the proliferation and security of nuclear weapons, efforts to ratify the ban on nuclear tests are stuck. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was adopted and opened for signature in 1996 as a key piece of our global nuclear security architecture. And as you all know, since then, 183 countries have signed the treaty and 162 have ratified. But in the United States, the process has been blocked in the US Congress. 
It's blocked elsewhere as well, including in China, importantly, which won't ratify until and unless the US does. And at the risk of utterly depressing everyone here, I must add one more problem to the list. And that's that all the nuclear weapon states today are now working to modernise their arsenals. Sending a powerful and unfortunate message about their lack of enthusiasm for arms control. The next sentence I wrote, I'm going to modify, but I'll read it to you as written, and I'll explain why I'm going to modify it. In a groundbreaking report released earlier this year, the Centre for Non-Proliferation Studies estimated that the United States alone will spend a staggering $1 trillion over the next three decades modernising and maintaining its nuclear arsenal. This now requires revision. In an excellent report, published only today, the Arms Control Association and Tom Kalina have set out the way to rethink these current plans. But this rethink actually and this is not a criticism of it, but it only saves 70 billion out of a trillion. It doesn't significantly reduce the scale of the challenge. Plans to ramp up modernization fly in the face of the pledges President Obama made in Prague. And as my now colleague Senator Nunn told the New York Times recently, a lot of it is hard to explain. The President's vision was a significant change in direction, but the process has preserved and reinforced the status quo. So yes, much of our agenda is stuck, and we're clearly in an unfortunate place today, having squandered a recent period of opportunity for progress on a variety of fronts, including reductions. But at the same time, we mustn't allow this negative state of affairs to drain our resolve. It may seem hopeless today, but it's important to remember that we will not always be in this moment. As the situation in Ukraine has demonstrated so clearly, the global security landscape can change unexpectedly and almost overnight. Fortunately, history has shown us that it can also change for the better. We can and we must work towards the day when it will change to favour our work and the work predicated by the, by the NPT. So as we continue to press ahead, I think we can all take some solace in the axiom proffered by my good friend Dr Lazina Serbo, the very able head of the CTBTO, it's a well-known fact, he said, in a speech last year, that frustration often paves the way for innovation. Perhaps the best starting place is, in the words of my colleague Dr Ian Cairns, the director of the European Leadership Network, that we address the issues that are right in front of us. We must firstly avoid the unintended escalation of the situation in Ukraine and manage the confrontation there effectively and responsibly. These de destabilising events confirm the need for a new approach to Euro-Atlantic security, which was the subject of the 2013 report, Building Mutual Security in the Euro-Atlantic, a process which I had the privilege of co-chairing with Sam Nunn, Igor Ivanov, and the former German Deputy Foreign Minister Wolfgang Issinger. Though written before Ukraine erupted, the report contains medium and long-term solutions that we still believe can contribute to solutions for the region. And additionally, the July 2014 position paper of the Task Force on Cooperation in Greater Europe, a European Leadership Network PISM, REAC and USAC initiative, predicted the detrimental effect that unilateral interventions, some of which we have seen, would have on the situation in Ukraine. To help manage the crisis, the report recommended steps, including military and political restraint, increased military-to-military -military communications, and direct dialogue both inside Ukraine and between Ukrainian parties and other actors, all designed to ensure that the actions on the ground did not lead to, to dangerous escalation. And these recommendations are still valid. During the whole of the Cold War, we had in place this sort of military-to-military -military and other communication for crisis management. We've forgotten how to do that and we need to get back to it so that we can control this situation and that it doesn't have the unintended consequences that it could have. Every day there are reports of events happening on the ground that could escalate. We in the European Leadership Network are in the process of compiling these. They are a frightening catalogue of incidents involving aircraft, ships, troops on the ground. We must do everything we can to get a deal done with Iran, or at the very least an agreement to continue the dialogue maintaining the status quo. In the, and I mean the status quo now. In the event of a deal, we must ensure that Congress approves the necessary sanctions relief. 
We must turn the Humanitarian Impacts Initiative into a shared enterprise across nuclear haves and have-nots rather than a new point of division. By focusing on preventing the worst not only through disarmament, but by de-alerting, by securing materials, by universalising the additional protocol and by ramping up considerably effective preparations to handle an incident should it happen. As Dr Patricia Lewis at Chatham House has written, the fact that it has taken decades to discuss the problem nuclear weapons create through our humanitarian framework demonstrates how adept our societies are at forgetting disguising and denying the overwhelming and the terrifying. We must not forget about tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. We need a more open and honest discussion about how most effectively we ensure European security with capabilities that actually are usable. The usual claim that alliance cohesion means that we have to stick to the status quo against the desires of the majority is not a good long-term strategy for maintaining cohesion. Indeed, it guarantees that alliance cohesion will come under major stress in times of crisis. It's improbable that the fault lines and opinions will not affect a decision whether DCAs should be scrambled and B-61s taken out of their vaults. Russia in the adversarial mode is utterly adept at dividing the alliance, particularly the European members of it. This is a godsend to them, and we need to address this. And I take heart too, and you should, because there are also innovative ideas out there about how to tackle many of these issues, and there's a great deal of innovative work going on as well presently. Let's begin with the P5 process. As the 2015 NPT review conference approaches, one question many of us have considered for a number of years is how to revitalise the process itself. Transparency is the key. I believe that we need to open it up and make it more accountable, and as one of the architects of it, I know where the flaws lie. One way to do that might be to hold a session at the review conference, for example, during which nuclear weapon states collectively are quizzed by non-nuclear weapon states on their progress on disarmament and the challenges that they face. There's broad agreement that all states need to reduce the salience attached to nuclear weapons, and it might be useful to have more discussions within formal NPT settings about what this actually means. These discussions could lead to proposals about what both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states could do to facilitate it. A successful 2015 NTP, NPT review conference also would require countries to take a series of steps before the conference convenes, but we're running out of time to do that. Among them, as proposed by the European Leadership Network in a recent statement, there is that Russia, the United States and the UK as the three NPT depository states <coughs> should issue a statement jointly with the UN Secretary General confirming that they will work towards setting up a conference on the WMD free zone in the Middle East. Nuclear weapon states should agree to be more transparent and demonstrate greater commitment to the goal of disarmament. Nuclear weapon states should participate in and help shape the agenda for the third planned conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons which is set to take place in Austria in December. The United States and Russia should reiterate their willingness to maintain a nuclear arms control and disarmament dialogue despite current tensions in their relationship. And somebody has to make the first move in relation to this. The prompt launch posture of the US and Russian nuclear forces may be an area right for progress too. A quarter of a century after the end of the Cold War, each country still deploys hundreds of long-term ballistic missiles, land and sea based, with roughly 2,000 nuclear warheads promptly set to destroy each other. Each maintains large nuclear forces on day-to-day -day alert, ready for launch and capable of hitting their targets in less than 30 minutes. This launch and warning posture is set to ensure that there can be no advantage from a first strike. But inherent in this posture is the risk of an accidental or unauthorised launch by either side, as well as the risk that a deliberate decision to use ballistic missiles will be made in haste on the basis of faulty or incomplete data. What's more, the risk posed by these forces, force postures are increasing as cyber threats and nuclear missile capabilities proliferate in other countries. So what can be done? Ultimately, the US and Russia could agree to mutual reciprocal steps to reduce dangers by changing the nature of our force postures. 
There could be, this could be, these could be taken as part of a future process to repair the breach opened between the West and Russia over Ukraine. In the meantime, I strongly believe that other governments and NGOs must work to increase awareness about this threat and keep the issue visible with governments and publics. We need to make it possible for Moscow and Washington to see the political and diplomatic benefits, in addition to the security benefits of acting on this issue. And we need to underscore to countries that might be considering adopting such force postures in the future, that they would decrease their security and have no support in the international community. Darrell recently has been promoting another interesting idea in conjunction with the third conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, which will be held in Vienna in December and the review conference next year. First, I'll repeat that it is important for the P5 countries to attend that conference, which they have not yet agreed to do. In fact, I tell you, from the point of view of the United Kingdom, if the US agree to go, we will go. I mean, it's no coincidence that we have not made up our mind for each of the last two conferences until immediately after the United States made the decision. <laughs> so it's important that, and, and I'm optimistic and hopeful, that strong voices within the US executive are making the argument for this. But this needs to be a cooperative effort. I mean, if you want to have nuclear weapons, you have to live with the responsibility of the consequences of them and explain to others how you will deal with that challenge. However, these two conferences were resolved in their final messages, and that's a debate, and whatever people think others involved in them are in, both of these conferences concluded that no country in the world can deal with the consequences of the use of nuclear weapons, and no country is capable of building the capability to do that. Now, either we agree with that or we disagree with it, those of us who hold nuclear weapons. If we agree with it, we have to explain then to the rest of the world who don't have these why that's a morally consistent position to be in and why we're not building the capability to do it. And if we don't agree with it, then we need to explain why it is wrong. But we are not uninterested in this. We have a responsibility, if we depend for our strategic security on these weapons, to engage with this challenge. Either that is true or it is not. And if it is true, we have to live with that consequence. And we need to be there. Anyway, I move away from Darrell's bright idea. Darrell argues that as the impetus <coughs> for a global nuclear weapons freeze, the United States and others at the conferences should press states not yet engaged in the nuclear disarmament process to freeze the size of their arsenals and their fissile material stockpiles as a first step towards multilateral ver verifiable reductions. He makes a compelling case that a freeze could lead to further disarmament. As for the CTBT, we're a long way away from 1996 when its adoption represented a high watermark for multilateralism. There's no question we've made progress since then, and the treaty has established a de facto global moratorium on testing. But we need to get the job done. And I'm confident that we can do it with a concerted, coordinated effort by governments, civil society, and the international scientific community. Today, the CTBTO's group of eminent persons, senior statesmen, politicians, and experts, is engaging with leaders and capitals of states that haven't ratified to press the case. All of us, though, can do more to answer arguments against ratification, and we can do it with answers based on not just critical thinking, but also on science. Among the arguments against the CTBT is that verification and monitoring won't work. But now we have a state-of-the-art system in place, and important improvements are still being made. So let me remind everyone here that we have a very solid answer to the CTB critics, and we must dedicate ourselves to providing them and demanding action from them. So these are just a few ideas for how to move forward. And let me also briefly describe one of the projects that NTI has been working on recently. I believe it offers a good example of the kind of innovative and groundbreaking work the NGO community can do, often comparatively, sorry, often cooperatively with governments to make progress on reducing the risks posed by nuclear materials and nuclear weapons. I'm referring to a two-year project entitled Innovating Verification, New Tools and New Actors to Reduce Nuclear Risks. 
The project has involved more than 40 technical and policy experts from a dozen countries collaborating to produce innovative new concepts and confidence building and transparency measures. And in a series of reports issued earlier this year, the project calls for the international community fundamentally to rethink the design, development and implementation of arms control verification. <coughs> Participants made recommendations on verifying baseline declarations on nuclear warheads and materials, on how to define and take advantage of societal verification methods, and on how to build global capacity. Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. It was important that the project was undertaken with experts from around the world, because although it may be a truism, it cannot be said enough when it comes to nuclear security, global challenges require global solutions, not to mention innovative thinking. That's what we strive for in all our projects at the NTI, and I know it's what has made the Arms Control Association a go-to resource for commentary on global nuclear security issues. Thank you again for inviting me to be with you today. And I look forward now to answering questions and hearing any ideas that you may have for how to make progress on these very complex and challenging issues. My own work in this field would not have been possible without a steady optimism about the possibility for progress. And the dedication of those of you here today gives me yet more cause for optimism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Des, for uh, those uh, very thoughtful, insightful, inspiring remarks. And I, uh, I see a number of hands poking up here. Um, so please raise them high. And uh, one of our, hey, Greg Thielman, I think um, you'll be first. And Jennifer has the mic. Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Brown, for your comments. I wondered if I could ask you also to comment on what the state of thinking is in Britain today, and I mean both the government and the public, in the wake of the uh, Scottish vote, uh, in the wake of the Trident Commission, in the wake of intense pressures on the British defense budget uh, that uh, modernizing the UK deterrent uh, imply. Well, wait, any other questions right now? He's answered them all. All right, David, why don't you ask yours and then he'll respond. Uh, David Kopp, I'm with the Quakers. I appreciate your comments, and I, in particular on the B61, and I would urge you to move this up on your agenda. Uh, in the year 2020, we're going to start producing the B61. The Obama administration, unfortunately, shows absolutely no interest in not pursuing this. This is some of the low-hanging fruit. It would be very helpful if you could get more Europeans to speak up like, your, like yourself. Uh, so I appreciate your comments, but we've got to have more European leaders putting pressure on Congress. Um, frankly, the Obama administration is dragging its feet. And if I could just add to that question, Des, I mean, one other part of it, I think, is perhaps if you could uh, offer your thoughts about what more NATO can do as a group to facilitate the discussion with Russia about how to deal with tactical nukes in Europe. I'm sure you have some thoughts about that. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I was kind of hopeful we might get further into the questions before we got to the Scottish question. <laughs> Sorry. But there you go. Um, right, so the situation in the UK is that we you know, I mean, whoever wins the next election in the UK 2015 faces, it would appear on the current timetable, the challenge of delivering on what the experts say is a necessity to make a decision about whether you replace the platforms or boats for the Trident missile system. Um, before I come to what I think will happen there, let me just tell you that when I was the Secretary of State in 2006, I was told that decision had to be made then. <laughs> yeah. But you remember, of course, you had a program called the Reliable Replacement Warhead, which was predicated on the fact that your warheads would become unstable and unusable within the foreseeable future unless they were replaced. And then, of course, there came the election of the one senator who voted against it, among others. And when he asked 
independent scientific advice to tell him whether or not that was correct. Uh, there was a change of policy. <laughs> and now these warheads are safe and secure for much longer. So, uh, so I am, um, in 2006, as the Secretary of State for Defence, was told two things, among many others, that I, you know, are freely in the public domain about um, our nuclear weapons system. One was that we had to start replacing the boats or else we would discover that we were unable to maintain continuous at sea deterrence. And secondly, I was told that we needed a replacement warhead and almost certainly we would need to make a decision in this current um, parliamentary cycle, in this current parliament, this uh, government's term, about replacing the warhead. So if you go back to the 2006 white paper that I partly drafted, it reflects that advice. Um, then there came along in 2010 the election of a coalition government, one party of whom was unwilling to accept the possibility of being responsible for the replacement of these boats and wanted the issue of the warhead to be looked at again. Oh, no, they didn't. President Obama's advice, I think, independent advice was adopted and suddenly we didn't need a new warhead. Um, but in, in any event, as far as the boats were concerned, conveniently for the coalition government, this became a decision that could be packed until after the next election and the boats were good for another five years. So you may have detected a degree of cynicism in my voice here about the nature of, uh, of uh, expert advice in this area, but there's a track record of um, this advice not being reliable and to some degree the answer to the question being depending on who's asking the question or if the question is being asked at all with any vehemence. So, so those who go in leading their parties hoping to be in government in the United Kingdom look at this possibility. If they win, they look at being the Prime Minister of a country and having to tell the people of the United Kingdom that a further three or perhaps five years of austerity face them with uh, be between 20 and 40 billion dollars, I know in your terms these is chicken feed, but 20 and 40 billion uh, pounds of uh, cuts in annual expenditure when a lot of people think we've already cut it to the bone. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm just about to spend £50 billion on replacing these boats. Now, that seems to me to be an improbable result of a general election in the United Kingdom, unless there is a majority uh, of the Conservative Party in government. I think that's the, the only possibility that will guarantee that that will be the outcome. Um, I think that the likelihood is that if there is a change of Prime Minister, that that Prime Minister will reach for the tool that most leaders do when they're faced with these sorts of challenges, and that is that he will have a review <laughs> and say, I want the experts to tell me whether or not this is true and if there's another way of doing it. Uh, and that, that's my, I've been convinced about that for some time. In fact, I've been convinced about that since um, the 2010 election. So I, th I think that that is probable, but um, interestingly, other commentators don't agree with me and people whom I admire, Malcolm Chalmers, for example, of Russi, who many of you may know, recently wrote that this was a settled issue and that these boats were going to be built, but they still cost a lot of money. Um, what has been settled, I think, is where the boats will be parked because the, uh, the outcome of the Scottish referendum means that the Trident Force will still be at Faz Lane and Coolport. Um, that would have been a challenge for the United Kingdom and therefore for NATO had Scotland become independent because it would have been part of the constitution of an independent Scotland that no nuclear weapons could be um, housed in the country. I think the only answer to that would have been to declare a part of an East Coast American naval base, part of the United, well, part of England, I think. <laughs> for the purposes of looking after it. The, the mayor of Cardiff allegedly said that he wanted them in Cardiff, but I don't think the people of Cardiff would have. Um, and I think the may say may have happened in other places where there were bases. Now, all of this would have been 
you know, a seismic shock, I think, to NATO and to, um, you know, I mean, sharing the burden of responsibility of, uh, of the nuclear, uh, strategic nuclear forces for the NATO alliance. It may or may not have been a good thing. I'm not entirely sure how it would have worked out, but um, but it certainly would have would have uh, increased. Uh, I think the concentrated the mind significantly on the um, value of these weapons to our collective security, which leads me, you know, to the question of European security. I mean, I'm known to I tell Americans this all the time, and I'll tell you this on the basis that I think the majority of people in this room are Americans. You need to tell the Europeans to look after their own defence. You know, I mean, this is an alliance in which Europeans need to make their proper contribution to their defence. And you need to argue against them suggesting that if some among our number share the burden of nuclear weapons by allowing tactical nuclear weapons to be in our country, then somehow we are sharing this defence. You know, these weapons have no military facility at all. There are, I have never met anybody in a uniform who contemplates ever using them. They are utterly political weapons and, they, and, and we've given them this kind of mystical value somehow in cohesion in Europe. But they're nothing of the sort. You know, the people who most want them there are the people who don't have them and can't have them. And the people who actually have them, I can tell you, would struggle to get anything through their parliaments that devoted a dollar to the maintenance of them. I mean, I cannot imagine the Parliament of the Netherlands voting in the majority for the cost of replacement dual-capable aircraft. I just can't imagine it. Can't imagine, the, I mean, if the Belgians had a government, <laughs> I can't imagine that government being willing to go to its parliament to try to do the same thing. The Turks don't have that problem because American aircraft are used. But the Italians don't even tell their people they exist. You know, so, I mean, these are odd weapon systems. And we have papered over the cracks of the divisions in Europe. And we did this because the United States, instead of understanding that it has a duty to lead, said to the Europeans, you make your decision and we will go along with it. Instead, they should have told them honestly, we want to bring these damn things home. They're a waste of money. And we're going to have to modernise them. And this is going to cost billions of dollars. But there are opportunities. You know, build into your budget for them some element in which the Europeans pay some of their share, even if it's proportionate. And we will very soon have a different dy dynamic in the discussion about these weapons. You know, stick to the decision that, it may, that, that you have already made about the new aircraft. There is no dual capable version of this planned yet. It will cost a lot of money to do it. But if they want it done, they can pay for it. And then we'll have a different discussion about these issues. These weapons serve no purpose and they are only a cause of division and they will be at the point of potential use, the most significant cause of division, as I say here. I mean, this idea that somehow they build cohesion because people uncomfortably agree to go along with the minority voice for the purposes of decision making is no basis for long term strategic decision making. Well, thank you for that answer, um, which was particularly detailed for not wanting to talk about the, uh, the, the, the Trident issue, but that was fabulous. That was a great. Um, all right, we've got a question up front and one in the back. So we'll take both of those and uh, have Des answer. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for that sober and thoughtful. Uh, and wise. Um, I'm Ward Wilson. Uh, could you comment a little bit on the uh, politics of disarmament? It seems to me that the humanitarian movement or initiative is gaining a certain amount of uh, headway and uh, that that is, uh, there's a constant flurry of rumors that eventually there'll be a discussion about having a ban treaty. So it seems to me that those of us who are pragmatic about these kinds of issues are caught in the middle. On the one hand, you have a rising tide of voices around the world for um, some greater measure of ban treaty or something. And on the other hand, you know, you have nuclear weapon states who are unreluctant, want to 
modernize their arsenals. So what, what can a pragmatist in the middle um, do in a circumstance where there's rising vo raised, raised voices on both sides? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Why don't you go ahead with this? Yeah. The, the, I mean, this is an extremely challenging environment, and I and I, I've I've kept very close to Ambassador Kement, whom I admire immensely, who's been given the responsibility by the Austrians for managing this process, and he's doing all he can to try and create an environment in which nuclear weapon states can be engaged. And I admire him immensely for, you know, what he has what he has sought to do. But he's not getting a lot of help from nuclear weapon states to do this. I mean, there. I don't normally argue by assertion, but this issue is not going away. And there are those in the five nuclear weapon states, and I have actually heard French people articulate this, that says, don't encourage them. You know, this will run out of steam. Or, 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 or worse, I heard on one occasion, a very senior French commentator um, suggesting that engaging with them would 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 give the people who were behind this movement some sort of credibility or respectability. I mean, this is utterly ridiculous, the idea that the vast majority of the world is waiting for credibility or respectability from five countries. You know. um, so this is not going away. And this is an issue that, 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 that um, we will need to keep coming back to. And please, you know, because I have respect for Americans and British and others, can we please stop using the worst argument possible in the world for non-engagement, which is that this is stopping us from doing all the positive things we're doing in the NPT. You know, you're just highlighting how much an activity there actually is in relation to the NPT from our perspective. This is the worst possible argument we could put forward. If we were doing something and about to turn up at the NPT RevCon to unveil a big basket of goodies, then that would be something, but we're not. We're struggling for something positive to say. So we're just, we're just reinforcing our inadequacy in this particular area. Secondly, can we stop using non-proliferation when all the rest of the world uses the world disarmament? I mean, why is it that everybody in the, the have side of this wants to talk about non-proliferation when all the rest of the world wants to talk about disarmament? You know, can we kind of tidy up that vocabulary and what, maybe work that in the glossary inside the P5 that we've been spending five, six years trying to work out? Just our reluctance to use the word disarmament. Um, I mean, for, for the very obvious reason that disarmament is a very strong contributor to security. Who believes that the world is a less... We've had this conversation before, Ward. I mean, we're in the same space, although we have a different dynamic in the way we approach it. But, I mean, who believes that the world is a less safe place because there are fewer chemical weapons in it? Maybe some left. Who believes the world is a, you know, a less safe place because there are few biological weapons? You know, cluster munitions, anti-personnel landmines. You know, disarmament is, is a very strong driver of security. You know, and there is an interesting, there's also, in, in relation to this issue of the ban treaty, that's an utterly respectable ambition to have. You know, if, 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 if you want to go to an international organization and encourage a treaty banning nuclear weapons, it's an utterly respectable position to have because we've been parties to movements, all of us, in which we've tried to ban weapon systems. It was a respectable thing to do. So don't dismiss it as if somehow, you know, it was a, an ambition which was likely to undermine our security collectively, because it's not. It's a respectable place to have, position to have, but you don't have to engage with the process to that purpose. And actually, the majority of the countries in the world are happy to engage with you to discuss the issues that I enumerated. I mean, let's deal with the issue of what are the responsibilities for having these weapon systems? For those of us who don't rely upon them, I mean, I, mean, I just pose this question to you. you know, I mean, if you are, if you are the, the leader of a Latin or South American country, none of whom have nuclear weapons, and none of whom benefit from an umbrella of nuclear weapons. And are they not entitled to ask those who hold these weapons some challenging questions? Because there are no upsides for them in these damn things. So we need to be in that environment, you know, and this process will continue. 
And we may find ourselves in the uncomfortable position that we have been in in the past, where we come late to these discussions. And then we contribute yet again to this interesting jurisdiction that is developing in the world, where we don't ratify, sometimes don't sign and ratify, but we don't ratify treaties, but we observe them. I mean, why are we in this situation in relation to the CTBT? You know, why does America go around the world threatening people with the International Criminal Court, which it pays for substantially, when it won't ratify the treaty itself? Why is it substantially observing the Anti-Personnel Landmine Treaty that it will not sign up to? Is it only because of what's happening in the Korean Peninsula or are there other issues? But it observes it substantially. You know, why are we, wh wh why is America not deployed or used cluster munitions since the, since the, the, since the convention was signed? I mean, wh why, why would a country of this power want to get itself into this kind of relationship with a series of treaties in which it signs and doesn't ratify, or neither signs and ratifies, but observes them? This is a very odd place to be. So, I mean, I think the United States, I mean, I'm a great admirer of the United States and its ability to be able to produce a room full of people like this. It needs to get to the centre of these discussions and make them work for the benefit of others. We need the capability in this world to be able to deal with the consequences of an Ebola virus and a discharge of a nuclear weapon accidentally or deliberately by some third force. We need to become part of the discussion as to how we do that. And you lead in the first and don't seem to want to have any part of the second. Thank you very much, Des. Uh, we unfortunately are out of time for this session and um, I want to uh, ask you all to join me in thanking Des for a really uh, thoughtful, thought-provoking and aspiring uh, address and answers to our questions. Uh, we want to continue to work with you in the future on these challenges and with NTI, uh, which is very lucky to have uh, him here in Washington. So thanks very much. Thank you very much.